Noon right on the dot, great. Uh, welcome to the Heritage Foundation. My name is John York, and I am at the Center for Principles and Politics, as is Arthur Millick. Uh, today's talk is entitled, Will We Ban Hate Speech? Lessons from Europe and the Threat of Big Technology. And this question is more vexing uh, than it might seem at first. Almost every word is uh, riven by ambiguity. First, what is hate speech? Some people may say, you know it when you see it, but uh, when it comes to legal sanctions and uh, even social sanctions, which are both at play with hate speech, rescission is definitely a virtue. Second, what does it mean to ban hate speech? Uh, surely if a law bans certain words or strikes certain thoughts from the mouths of citizens, we're, we're, we're surely dealing with a ban. Most European countries have such legal bans on hate speech as we'll hear. And calls are growing within this country to ban hate speech in this way. But what about if the punishment for hate speech isn't jail, but simply being banned from a website or being demonetized? Is that a ban? Third, who are the we that's doing all this banning? Is it we the voters? Is it we the users of a website or the employees and employers, college faculty and student bodies of the country? Or is it not we at all, but a distant group of elites in Silicon Valley, Washington, DC? Of course, they're not so distant from us right now. <laughs> or even Brussels. As conservatives, as we approach these questions, they're particularly nettlesome, because we're riven between two ideological commitments that are equally strong. First, that private companies and private communities should be able to operate as they please. And second, the belief that freedom, uh, freedom of speech is key to a free and open political contestation. And yet, uh, this is a conversation we must have. To help us understand, first, uh, what, what hate speech is and how it should be defined. Two, what has happened within European countries that have banned hate speech under the law. And third, the effects of big tech's campaign against hate speech Right here at home, we have the following speakers. First, Arthur Millick. He is Associate Director and a Research Fellow at the B. Kenneth Simon, Simon Center for Principles and Politics at the Heritage Foundation. He has published widely on this subject and others, and has an upcoming Heritage Report on uh, the subject of hate speech. So look out for that. We also have Kalan Kitchen, also at the Heritage Foundation. He's a Senior Research Fellow at the Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy. Uh, before that, he worked for Senator Ben Sass as his national security advisor and spent 15 years in the U.S. intelligence community. And then Paul Coleman, he is the executive director of the Alliance Defending Freedom International in Vienna and is the author of Censored, Why European Laws Are a Threat to Free Speech. He has also been involved in more than 20 cases before the European Court of Human Rights, which is, I suspect, a very difficult venue <laughs> to fight on these issues. Uh, with no further ado, I hand it over to Arthur. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as the desire to ban so-called hate speech continues to grow in America, we should try to understand some of the arguments that the left presents on its behalf uh, in order to seek this outcome. And we should think through some of the implications for our nation, uh, should this come to be. Uh, before I do that, I just want to go very quickly through the original arguments for the freedom of speech to kind of explain why it is we have it at all. Uh, the founders and the kind of liberal tradition from which they arose uh, had two uh, understandings of why the freedom of speech is so important. The first is uh, for the pursuit of the truth, especially in philosophy and science. Your speech belongs to you because your mind belongs to you. And therefore, speech is an expression of that thing that belongs to you. And its highest purpose, its highest culmination, is the pursuit of the truth. Uh, that's the first reason. The second is that uh, we are a free people who believe in self-government. And the freedom of speech is absolutely necessary for self-government. Uh, you uh, cannot deliberate on the public good without speaking about it and thinking it through in the public square. And while the uh, public square was, in certain ways, more sanitized uh, during the time of the founding than it is today, uh, nevertheless, there is a clause in the Constitution that allows for absolute free speech in the house, uh, on the floors of our deliberative bodies. And that, in my mind, is a very strong proof of what the political purpose of it was, that there is absolute free speech when there is the need to rule oneself in all matters of public concern. Uh, that's why uh, we originally had it. 
But then there's this third element of why we have the freedom of speech. And it's because it forms citizens' characters in very specific ways. Uh, it makes us, them, citizens of a free society rational as opposed to tyrannical and assertive as opposed to slavish. Uh, the freedom of speech means uh, being capable of speaking freely and learning to make, make sound judgments on political matters. It also means, uh, this is one of the most important ones, it also means possessing a mind open to being persuaded by rational arguments and the qualities correspondingly, the qualities of mind capable of persuading others. This is an essential part of our national character. Um, and you can't just recreate that. It takes generations of habit and discipline to form people that are capable of doing these things. Um, the opposite of this, of course, is force. And when you look at some of these kind of reels from uh, uh, foreign parliaments, you often see them coming to fisticuffs. Uh, we've, we, we almost never do that. We have this kind of discipline within us that we learn and practice through uh, the habits of uh, developed through free speech. Um, now, as you know, I mean, this is why we're gathered here. Uh, it may be so that uh, banning so-called hate speech is on the horizon. And as Paul Colmel will discuss today, it's already been done uh, everywhere in Europe uh, and in Canada. And it's happening in America. Uh, anyways, one of the main places that it's happening in America is on America's universities. Uh, prominent Americans are now calling for it. Um, now, so far, one could say that the Supreme Court has restrained this push in a 2007 unanimous decision called uh, Matal Vitam. Uh, they ruled, I'm going to quote, quote it for you, uh, that public expression of ideas may not be prohibited merely because the ideas are themselves offensive to some of their hearers. So that's a unanimous decision. But I would urge conservatives not to rely on that too heavily because, as you know, the Supreme Court changes its mind from time to time. And uh, it depends so much, in the end, regrettably, on public opinion. As the winds of public opinion shift, so too can the court shift. That's utterly, uh, that's utterly imaginable. And especially as a generation of young people are being prepared on our college campuses, to think that speech, certain kinds of speech that are deemed offensive should be banned, that's the next generation which will determine public opinion. And the courts may very well go along with them. So you can't just depend uh, on court rulings. Now, I, I want to get into very briefly some of the arguments that advocates for outlawing hate speech make on their behalf. And I think that there are specifically three kinds, and I'm going to go through them. The first is they say that uh, hate speech uh, is a, leads to a physical harm. Uh, exposure to hate speech, they claim, leads to depression, high blood pressure, drug abuse, you name it. Every social ill or pathology can be blamed on an exposure to hate speech. And some European laws, as Paul Coleman uh, will discuss in a moment, uh, make the claim that even concealed statements, which at first glance may seem to be rational or normal, let alone overt words, can bring these harms. Um, it's not what you say, it's, it's mainly what you may imply that may bring about these devastating harms. So that's the first claim. The second claim is that so-called hate speech excludes people from politics. Okay, this means that individuals or groups cannot be members of a political community unless, unless they feel fully welcomed or even celebrated by all. Now you may think that in America, since everybody now has voting rights, since uh, the power of the freedom of speech can persuade people that this shouldn't be a problem. But you'd be wrong to assume that. Uh, the theory goes that a minority cannot speak to a majority because of a power differential. In other words, there's no reasoning with a majority because reason is connected to power. The majority's reason is defined by keeping their power. That is to say, a majority is cognitively distorted in a fundamental way and cannot be persuaded. For that reason, perhaps they have to be compelled. Bizarrely, while advocates claim that hate speech causes all sorts of physical and psychological harms, 
but at the same time claim that those harmed are perfectly capable of speaking rationally and persuading, but it's the majority who's distorted and deformed. Uh, that's the second claim. The third claim. Uh, the third claim, and what I take to be the most important one, is that hate speech harms dignity. Now, everybody talks about dignity today, and nobody really knows what it means. Um, just basic, very basically, I, I think it's a concept that political theory professors, especially academics, use to find a kind of solid ground of describing what is permanent in us and what is respectable in us. So to put the matter differently, uh, what is the core of our, human, our humanness once you can no longer rely on religion, or therefore an understanding of the soul, or on reason, and therefore natural rights? I think the uh, influential, very influential, academic named Charles Taylor has the kind of clearest statement on what dignity is. Uh, for him, dignity is the potential for forming and defining one's own identity. Uh, it's the potential for forming and defining one's own identity. So you may ask, well, why do we need to create an identity? Why not just stick with what you've got? Well, the answer is that many identities they claim are historically oppressed. These identities must be given free reign to create themselves, whether on sexual or racial grounds, but with one important qualification. If you're labeled an oppressor identity, then you must not only be denied an identity, you must also perpetually atone for the sins inherited through your identity. Correspondingly, marginalized groups are not only free to speak as they please, but the implication is these groups must speak against the majority, for the majority, they claim, actively denies them an identity. In other words, while the majority must be silenced, the public square becomes wide open to cultivating hatreds, accusations, and falsehoods against the majority. Anger and resentment come to be encouraged and even honor, honored, as does victimhood. Needless to say, this is not a stable dynamic uh, in which any country can live. Uh, and it feels more like antagonisms leading to some kind of conflict. Um, now, the critical component of this new understanding of dignity, i.e. self-created identity, is that um, it's not enough to just create your own identity, but others must recognize you and must recognize your identity. So in other words, um, others must be made to respect you as you would like to be respected according to your unfalsifiable uh, self-created identity. And without the protection from harsh words, you cannot be your authentic self. This means that nearly all identities must not only be tolerated, but celebrated. Until now, America's traditional standard has been toleration. This means that the law should protect all citizens' rights, but that citizens can disagree with one another. This standard meant that citizens would respect one another for disagreeing with each other, rather than seeking to punish them on the basis of disagreement. Today, however, Non-recognitions of non-recognition of someone's identity, even only in speech, is considered violence. Here we should bear in mind the important distinction between the freedom of speech and the freedom of expression. The freedom of speech is rational and political, as I described it very curtly uh, before. But expression is different. Uh, what does one express? One expresses one's identity. And therefore, it's perfectly consistent to say that a country can have absolute expression of nearly all identities except oppressor identities and have no freedom of speech, no political public freedom of speech. The new, I, I want to add one final qualification, uh, that the new speech uh, kind of standards that are emerging out of the literature uh, have one important qualification, and I'm quoting a very famous academic. He says that, Bigoted factual claims that are fundamentally defamatory are not tolerated. Bigoted factual claims that are fundamentally defamatory are not tolerated. Uh, this would mean that one can't speak about matters of public policy or human merit, even if it's uh, uh, factual, true. Certain issues of public policy must be per pushed aside 
and so must the principle of self-rule. This means in America, for instance, or in any nation, no more discussion of immigration, the family, crime, as these kinds of public discussions that uh, anybody would say are essential to a nation's future must be pushed off the table. Uh, this also means, of course, correspondingly, that any identity narrative, any self-created identity narrative, must be taken at face value and cannot be disputed through argument. Everyone must be made to accept, for example, that all of history was oppression, and whatever a group tells the public about itself must be celebrated. Uh, I think that the radical goal behind these theories, well, one of them anyways, is the following. Um, since the human capacity for judgment is what would discern truth from falsity and virtue from vice, it's human reason which is guilty of causing harm. As such, it op its operations must be thoroughly circumscribed or perhaps even altogether smothered. The honest advocates of this position come pretty close to admitting this. Uh, I'm quoting one of them. Coming to grips with hate speech does pose serious problems for a society committed both to equality, understood as equal self-respect, and to individual freedom. That's a pretty clear statement. In other words, if you want a nation devoted to equality, defined not as natural rights, but as equal self-respect, you can't have political liberty. And this is a choice which some advocates, I think, are willing to make. Uh, of course, we should be kind uh, and decent to our fellow citizens and uh, refrain from gratuitously demeaning them. There's no question about that. But, restri but restricting offensive speech does not bring about the utopia of equal self-respect, but will push us deeper into the politics of resentment and the corresponding backlash against it. I think that basically the, uh, America's future depends on a majority of Americans still deeply believing that the freedom of speech is something sacred, that it is something necessary uh, to our way of life, holding therefore political liberty as the highest political ideal, and that will be the only main restraint on the descent of this kind of new order. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the, to the Heritage Foundation and to Arthur in particular for inviting me here to, to speak on this topic. Arthur and I have been pen pals from across the pond on the issue of hate speech for the last couple of years. So it's great to, to be here and talk about this issue today. I often find that when I come across uh, from Europe to the US, I come as a, a canary in the coal mine trying to bring a, a cautionary tale from a foreign land. Um, because Europe is in a very, very difficult place in regard to free speech. Europe has hundreds of uh, criminal restrictions on speech across the continent in every country. Now, these laws arose mostly in the wake of the Second World War and have been expanded ever since. We have the United Nations, the European Union, the European Court of Human Rights, these other institutions established to defend human rights, including a freedom of speech, who are actively pushing for the criminalization of speech and for more hate speech laws. And so each year, we see these restrictions grow. And when I come here to the US and I see and hear discussions on hate speech in the media, in the public square, uh, people often sort of vaguely point to Europe as a potential model uh, that could be followed in terms of regulation of speech. So what I would like to do in the next 10 minutes or so is just explain the European model, so to speak, of censorship. And I want to do two things. I want to outline briefly um, three aspects of European hate speech laws and then three effects of those laws. So first of all, just three aspects of European hate speech laws. So the first one is that these laws um, are incredibly vaguely defined. There is almost no universally agreed definition of hate speech, as was uh, referenced in the intro remarks. And in fact, there was an Economist article uh, a few months ago, and it was headlined, Germany is silencing hate speech, but cannot define it. And that neatly sums up the problem. And because no one can neatly identify what is hate speech, uh, the line, therefore, between free speech and criminal hate speech is incredibly, and some would say deliberately, blurred. 
And let me just give you one example of one law. I've not come here to quote a lot of European legislation to you this afternoon, but I'll give you one example from Austria, which is where I'm based. And the criminal code says this, whoever in circumstances where his or her behavior is likely to arouse justified indignation, publicly disparages or insults a dogma, that person shall be liable to six months imprisonment. So here we see the disparagement or insult, not of a person, but of a dogma, of a belief, and that is a criminal offense. And the reason I mention uh, this particular section of the criminal code is because there's a very recent case involving it, which I will come back to. So firstly, uh, the definition of hate speech is incredibly vague, and therefore hate speech laws are very blurred. Uh, the second point is the selective enforcement of these hate speech laws. So not surprisingly, it is impossible to police the speech of an entire continent. There are about 800 million people living in Europe, and about 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every single minute, every minute, and hundreds of millions of tweets sent every single day. And it is impossible to police that kind of speech in the digital age, because so much speech is offensive to someone. But there is uh, a few people who are, um, become the victims of these hate speech laws, and they are the people who speak out on the politically charged topics. So you can imagine what many of these topics are, topics like uh, the sanctity of life, marriage, the family, sexuality, um, in, in Europe particularly, issues like uh, immigration and radical Islam, and so these subjects uh, become the, the major subjects of hate speech cases and the enforcement of hate speech laws. And so in the last few years, for example, we've seen um, bishops and cardinals and other ministers of religion investigated by the police for hate speech. We've seen journalists fined and imprisoned. And we've even seen private conversations between citizens become the subject of criminal complaint all around these areas, these hot topics of current um, political debate. And then the third aspect of European hate speech laws I wanted to raise is the fact that in most cases, in many of the laws, there is no actual victim. So let's turn back to that section of the Austrian criminal code, section 188. And it involved a, a famous case from about 10 years ago, a woman named E.S. She's named that for her own safety because her actual name is not published. And she gave a series of lectures on Islam in Vienna in 2009. And in one of the points that she made in one of these lectures was the age of Muhammad when he married Aisha. Now, according to Islamic sources, Aisha was around about six years old and Muhammad was 53 at the time. And ES makes certain points regarding the age uh, discrepancy between these two people in less than flattering terms. And her lecture became the subject of a criminal complaint because an undercover reporter infiltrated this lecture series, heard these comments, reported them to the public prosecutor who launched a prosecution. And ES was convicted of hate speech and she was fined, she lost every appeal, and then in January of this year, 10 years later, uh, she lost at the European Court of Human Rights. And what's incredible, there are many things about this case that are interesting, but one of them is that there was no victim of this hate speech in the case. There was no offended person. It, the whole case was based on the idea that hypothetical people who didn't exist in reality might be offended by this speech. They might be, they could be, likely to be, but there weren't actually any victims of the hate speech. And that is an extraordinary way for the criminal law to operate. So there's many more things I, I could say about um, European hate speech laws, and of course we don't have time now, but perhaps we will do in the discussion time. So I wanna move from some of these aspects of European hate speech laws to then some of the effects that we're seeing uh, in Europe. And the first and perhaps most obvious effect of Europe's hate speech laws is more censorship. In that sense, censorship begets censorship. Or to echo Orwell, once the shrinking dictionary 
begins. There really is no logical stopping point. So we see the scope of these laws growing all the time. And what began as restrictions on some of the most extreme forms of speech uh, now includes, of course, uh, criminal uh, law addressing Islamophobic hate speech, homophobic hate speech, transphobic hate speech, misogynistic hate speech, and the list goes on and on. The scope of these laws increases each year. Secondly, the threshold of what's considered hate speech uh, is getting lower and lower and lower. And so once we had the extreme forms of speech in the, in the wake of the Second World War, today there are moves to criminalize wolf whistling as misogynistic hate speech. Uh, there are moves to criminalize silent prayer outside abortion facilities, and that is actually happening in London, in Australia, in Canada. Uh, and we see pro-life websites being taken down and, and many other examples. In the last couple of months in the UK, there has been a serious discussion and debate and criminal investigation into someone who posted an offensive limerick, an offensive poem that was considered to be uh, a transphobic uh, poem. We've seen um, jokes become the subject of criminal complaint and so on and so forth. And then thirdly, we see the means of restricting uh, speech grow as well as uh, into more and more areas of public life. So what started in the criminal code moves into workplace codes, campus codes, and of course, as we'll hear soon, online. So censorship leads to more censorship. Secondly, censorship also leads to self-censorship. So this is the chilling effect of hate speech laws, or what's also known as the you can't say that culture. Because many hate speech cases don't actually result in a criminal conviction, very, very few. But it's the stigma that being involved in one of these cases creates that's one of the greatest problems with hate speech laws. We have a politician who criticizes immigration policies and they are labeled as a racist. Or a preacher who speaks on the biblical definition of marriage and they're known as a homophobe. Or we have one who dares to advocate for the truth of his or own position labeled as a bigot. And not surprisingly, most people don't like having these labels attached to themselves. And they see all of this reported in the media. They see people being hauled before the courts. And they self-censor because they don't want the police knocking at their door investigating their speech. And so we see this uh, effect, this chilling effect of Europe's hate speech laws in the form of self-censorship across the continent. And in many ways, that's one of the major goals, I would say, of hate speech laws, to change attitudes and behaviors. So it's not only, at this point, a you-can't-say-that culture, but also a you-can't-think-that culture as well. Thirdly, and to really pick up on what Arthur was saying in, in the end of his remarks, um, another effect of Europe's hate speech laws is not peace and harmony as such, but arguably more division and more polarization. Proponents of hate speech laws um, claim that they prevent hatred, that they prevent division, and ultimately prevent it leading to violence. But there is more tension and division in Europe today than at any other point since the Cold War. And some of the greatest political and societal tensions that we see in Europe are in the countries that have the strictest speech laws. We see what's happening in places like France and Germany and Sweden and Netherlands. You see it in the news. You see huge tensions uh, politically and societally. And these are all in countries with very strict restrictions on speech. So at the very least, we could say these laws are ineffective but I think they're actually playing a role in fostering some of this division and in fostering some of the polarization we see. Because they remove a voice from citizens, they cause people to feel disenfranchised. Genuine hatred is driven underground and it cannot be so easily countered with better speech. And hate speech laws create a, a victimhood mentality of those claiming that they're offended with the laws often used as weapons to shut down debate. 
And then we have the wealthy nonprofits and the semi-governmental agencies set up to counter this alleged rise in hatred within society. And so they constantly are driving a narrative that hate is on the rise. And therefore, they need more funding to counter it. And so an entire hate industry has been created that needs a narrative of hatred for its own revenue stream. And we see these laws helping to create this effect. So as we look at Europe, at the very least, we could say that it's patently obvious these laws are not working. But arguably, I would say they're actually helping to foster some of the tensions we're witnessing. So let me conclude with my canary in the coal mine remarks. The US has obviously not followed the same legal path as Europe. But in many ways, it appears to be adopting the same mentality. And the three things that I mentioned of the aspects of European hate speech laws, how vaguely they're defined, how selectively they're enforced, and how they have no real victim in many of the cases. I drew out these three things in particular, because as we look at the policies now appearing in big tech, we can say exactly the same thing. If we see the policies on college campuses, we see exactly the same thing. So the federal law might not have changed in the US, but the mentality is clearly creeping in. And if America does not heed the warnings of Europe, then I think it will surely be destined to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Juan? <clears throat> so uh, just to briefly recap, what, what, we've, what we've done thus far is we've begun by articulating the underlying philosophical notion of hate speech, where it comes from and, 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 and what it seeks to do. And now we just heard an excellent articulation of, of what it looks like when that worldview is implemented politically. Um, within the American context, it seems particularly important and relevant about how hate speech is presenting itself and being operationalized uh, within the technology sector. And that's because an increasing uh, portion of public commentary and uh, public discussion engagement happens online, typically through social media and other uh, technology platforms. And so it's, it's my goal to briefly uh, explain, frankly, how these companies are thinking about this, why it produces the uh, community standards policies uh, that are at the heart of so much of kind of current political dialogue. And so the first thing to understand is, one, there is an ideological commitment to the philosophy that Arthur laid out. It, this, this notion of um, a hyper-realized individual autonomy, a, a self-derived identity, this is broadly held within much of the technology industry. Not only the technology industry, but particularly the technology industry. And behind that ideological commitment to individual autonomy and expression is a coherent, not in that it's good, but in that it's rational and, and internally consistent, uh, business commitment to something that's called authenticity. So often when uh, these tech companies will speak on these issues, the, the, the term of art, the, the point of reference is almost always authenticity. And the reason for that is that it's, it's, it's what is at root of what they're trying to accomplish online. So in the case of particular social media companies, uh, in, very, in one very real sense, they're, they're trying to virtualize the real world. They want that, that virtual world that you're participating in, whether it be you know, some type of social dialogue or, or perhaps ultimately a virtual reality kind of thing. They want it to feel authentic. They want it to feel real to you, at least real enough to encourage you to participate. And it's because authenticity drives user adoption, uh, which in turn drives the business model. And the business model for many of these companies is in-depth, reliable data. Does that make sense? I mean, this is what they do. Face, Facebook or, or, or the, they're not in the business of, of making sure you have a platform to post cat videos. That's not the model, right? The model is descriptive, detailed, reliable audience services that they can then sell um, people who want to engage those audiences. Nothing wrong with that. 
but it's just good for us to be clear on what their business model is, what they're actually doing. And authentic behavior is predictable behavior. And it is necessary for advertising and other audience-based services that are sold by these companies. So authenticity is, is kind of a fundamental prerequisite to what they're trying to do as companies. Um, this also fits, though, within the underlying worldview. So I, I, I want to be clear as I make this point that it's, it's not only a business decision. It is a coherent business decision with an underlying philosophy to which they hold. Now, safety then, and Arthur touched on this, is the prerequisite for authenticity. Users will not be themselves if they do not feel safe to be themselves as they participate on these platforms. Um, and therefore, we, the companies, have to then make them feel safe. How do we provide a service to them that, that our users feel safe in using and adopting? hopefully in, in greater and greater uh, volume. And so when you have conversations with the companies, they will almost always speak in terms of physical safety. So when you begin to have a conversation about community standards, the first thing uh, that is often referred to is, well, we, 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 you know, we don't want self-harm videos. We don't want videos that are calling for violence against this group or that group or, or anything that might you know, lead to some type of, um, of real-world uh, application of violence or, or a lack of, of physical safety. Um, however, increasingly the cases that actually matter, the ones that are actually setting the parameters for this broader social conversation, regard not physical safety, those are largely agreed to and understood, but the notion of psychological safety. Um, they are currently using a whole host of, of academic literature and researchers who hold this worldview to apply a type of analytic veneer to decisions that ultimately quell hate speech. And again, not just speech that could hurt someone physically, but speech that is possibly going to cause someone to feel like they can't be their authentic self in the moment. That's a pretty low bar. And as was already mentioned, it's not one that sits still. It's a, uh, it's a fluid standard. And we're seeing this. Now, that is being coupled with this now established view of, of word violence, that, that you can actually speak a word to an individual and that that is tantamount to physical violence. There's, there's actually an argument that says it's, 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 there should be no distinction. Um, and I think that's wrong, but this view is, is gaining in its prevalence. And what that does is it establishes an operational baseline that enables the censoring of essentially any non-approved language at scale. So a company can decide that our community standards are going to be such that we think that this limits people's authentic behavior and therefore we're going to say you can't do this. Now up until this point, there's been some constraints on just how aggressively these types of um, policies can be rolled out. But it is not static. It is expanding. And as the social uh, progressive notions of these things kind of takes hold and becomes more politically viable, they will. There's every reason to understand that these notions will be expanded in terms of their application on these platforms. Now, sometimes this becomes a real problem for them uh, as, as these companies are, are not quite up to speed with the bleeding edge of the progressive push. So there will be a progressive political push for a, a more stringent application of this hate speech banning uh, that these companies just politically can't do, right? I'll give you an example of something that I, I think is near term. Um, the pro-life position online. Uh, in the current political context, this is a, a, a it's, it's always a relevant issue. It's always a pressing issue. But particularly in light of what some states are doing in terms of um, their laws, this issue is now becoming um, fraught with tension, such that you could imagine a group of users uh, on an individual platform saying, listen, um, I had an abortion. And people making arguments on my feed that um, abortion is, is murder or, or some type of moral failing make me feel unsafe. I feel like they're provoking violence against me. 
I feel like someone could see that their political disagreement with, with me would be justification for taking some type of, of action, whether it be physical or, or psychological. And it's not hard to believe that a platform would go, you know what, you're right. And we're going to enact a community standard now. And we're going to, it would be incremental. I, I doubt it would be as explicit as, okay, there will be no more pro-life activity on our platform. But it, 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 might, get, it might get downgraded. Uh, it might migrate into channels that are increasingly um, less open uh, until the political uh, freedom to, to, to take even more stringent action is achieved. Now, I don't know that that's going to happen. But the fact that, that it's not hard to imagine is indicative by itself. And so I think that's kind of the types of challenges we're going to be looking at. Now, as conservatives, that's, that's what this conversation is. It's you know, a platform of conservatives trying to think through this. And, and conservatives recognize that, that we live in a, a tension here. Um, we have a historical, I think rightly founded, skepticism of regulatory actions. And that constrains our response. Um, and up until this point, even conservative users of these uh, platforms have not been sufficiently motivated to vote with their feet. Uh, if you were to ask me what search engine I use, it'd be a search engine that works really, really well. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't always agree with that search engine, right? Uh, and so this is something that we are having to, to deal with. And it's also the truth that many conservative values like free speech also extend to these private companies. They're American companies. Um, and hate speech or counter hate speech laws are also, I think, at this point, unlikely to generate the intended outcomes that we would often identify. I mean, if you believe in free speech, you have to extend this privilege to American companies too. Or you have to do some type of a radical reevaluation of much of the way we've been doing and thinking about these things up until this point. I think it's also important to understand that, that bias in some of these services is an inherent part of those services. So for example, search engines. Search engines serve you up results based on what they think you're looking for. And that inherently means they're going to show you something and they're going to not show you something. There's no way to do that absent some type of bias. That is curation, right? And the same thing happens in terms of your news feed on a social media site. They understand that you want to hear from your friend Jane, and you're not as excited about Crazy Uncle Joe, right? And they understand that from your behavior online. They understand that you get better results and are more pleased with the service when they curate that material that way. Now, all that being said, that is not in any way, shape, or form an excuse for a deliberate political bias, and it's something that conservatives are fundamentally going to have to think about and understand. But as we do that, it is important that we understand the nuances of what these services are and how they work, right? It will not do anyone any good if we're only beating up straw men. That is not to say, however, that the challenge is not real. The challenge very much is real. And so that's what this group is trying to think through. That's the conversation that we're provoking, I think, today. And then finally, I do have to say one, one final note. I'm, I'm fundamentally a national security guy. This is the way I think. It's what I'm, it's what I'm about. And it is undeniable that many of these companies, many of these technology um, platforms and companies are developing uh, technologies that are not only going to shape society, but that are going to be necessary for defending that society going forward. And so as we engage them and as we try to shape as a society how we're going to move forward, even under the threat of, of expansive hate speech, I do have this constant refrain in my own mind in terms of how do we do this in such a way as to where accountability is real, where freedom is and liberty are maintained and pursued, but then also where we don't unnecessarily hurt an industry that is going to be essential for our long-term thriving. None of those questions are easily answered. And anyone who pretends that they are is either ignorant or misleading you. And so that's why we hold conversations like this today and why you get you know, rock stars like these guys. So with that, I'll happily transition. Well, we have some time for questions from the audience. So we'll open it up to that now.
Let's see. Uh, so you first go ahead. Yes, right in the back. Uh, great, thank you. Hi. Um, Carrie, oh. He's plugged in here. I'm sorry. Carried to the furthest extreme, would it then mean that a foundation like Heritage would have to be demolished? Maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe. Uh, uh, it's possible to reclassify uh, almost all forms of political speech as being somehow uh, a cause of marginalizing certain identities. So I will give you just, uh, you know, I gave you guys a couple of examples about immigration, crime, the family. Those are pretty obvious. Um, but another less obvious example is that uh, there's a piece in the New York Times, plenty of pieces like this, uh, that has alleged that uh, discussions of tax policy is a racist dog whistle. So that seems to be a neutral kind of thing that uh, a, a public, even if all of these more contentious issues, uh, should be able to debate. And yet even that, uh, it's possible, could be found somehow harmful uh, to an identity. Uh, so. Uh, the Heritage Foundation engages in precisely that kind of speech. Uh, I guess a, a question for uh, Paul would be, uh, is it possible to question hate speech laws? Uh, in other words, that, that too may at some point be off the table, considered um, something that has been finalized once and for all. So. Well, I would yeah, piggyback on that and say that ADF, as with Heritage, deals on many different issues um, and lots of different policy issues and legal issues. Right now, I consider the biggest battle, the biggest issue, to be the freedom to even discuss all the other issues. Uh, the biggest battle is the battle to have the platform for everything else. And we have seen a real seismic shift um, in that battle in, in such a short period of time really, in the last few years. And it doesn't just affect the issues that we're talking about. We're seeing it across the board on, on many different issues of public interest, where there has become uh, just an increased hysteria uh, within public discourse uh, uh, and such an impulsive desire to shut down uh, speech of one's opponents, or ones with whom you disagree. And we're seeing it across the board. And so I think that um, I agree um, in terms of could could Heritage was shut down, ADF, of course, we, by one of the leading um, organizations within the hate industry, uh, ADF is known as a hate group. And of course, you, you see how this is being used to, to label, to silence, to ban. And indeed, our position, my position on free speech, on liberty, uh, is uh, one of the justifications, one of the reasons why uh, we are treated um, with great uh, disdain in many circles uh, within Europe and within the international apparatus. Um, because if you uh, try to strike down hate speech laws, if you criticize hate speech laws, then of course that is you're in league with the haters. And so the, the freedom to criticize them is increasingly being limited. Right here, go ahead. So my question has to mainly uh, really directed towards Paul here. Um, so when you were ex ex to like expand more on the ES case, mm. what were some of like the implications of what that um, that s simulation kind of represented? I'm trying to really understand what kind of makes it so provocative. Well. The European Court of Human Rights delivered its decision in ES versus Austria and held that uh, ES did not have the right to freedom of expression in her criticism of Mohammed. In a roundabout, within a week or two time period, at the same time as the Pakistani Supreme Court acquitted Aisha Bibi of blasphemy. It's an incredible contrast to see that unfold at the same time frame. 
essentially what it indicated is that in many ways this ES case ushered in and solidified the idea of um, blasphemy laws in Europe in a new name, in the, in the guise of hate speech laws. And so I think in many ways the case is not just one of many hate speech cases, of which there are many, but the timing of it, uh, the timing of it as compared to the HBB case and the judgment itself with the European Court of Human Rights indicated to me just that Europe and many of the courts within Europe have taken now a very solid position in favor of blasphemy laws, albeit in another name. And since you asked, and I had it in my notes, but it's too long to read, I will read you one paragraph, if I may, from the ES case, from the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, which obviously I'm not prone to reading long quotes on panel discussions, but I think it'll be worth your while. Let me tell you what the European Court of Human Rights said. They said, the Austrian courts comprehensively assessed the wider context of the statement and carefully balanced ES's right to freedom of expression with the rights of others to have their religious feelings protected and to have religious peace preserved in Austrian society. The courts discussed the permissible limits of criticism of religious doctrines versus their disparagement and found that the statements had been likely to arouse justified indignation in Muslims. Remember these hypothetically. In addition, the European Court of Human Rights considers that the statements were not phrased in a neutral manner, aimed at being an objective contribution to a public debate concerning child marriages, but amounted to a generalization without factual basis. That is a striking paragraph. That was January of this year at the European Court of Human Rights. And the significance of this thinking we will see, I think, in, in many years to come. Uh, can I just follow up uh, very quickly on that? The, the, the laws, uh, any law informs human psychology and behavior. That's its purpose. And so you'd have to think about uh, what it is these laws provoke, what elements of our character these kinds of laws provoke. And what Paul said, or the quote is so, both so ugly but so nice uh, in, in, this, is in this way that one, the law's standard will be judged by anger. So whoever is aggrieved, the angriest, should have justice on their side. And um, this leads to a kind of tyrannical fanaticism on those who feel deeply that their anger must be honored. And anger is not, uh, uh, need not have justice in it. Justice is a, a rational, intelligible standard that by virtue of being that is intelligible to all and that all can agree on some kind of standard of justice. And so these laws actually risk provoking a new kind of fanaticism. The American alternative uh, has been for, since our founding, the exact opposite. Uh, Thomas Jefferson kind of nailed this from the beginning, saw all of this psychology from the very beginning, and said that um, we should have the freedom of expression, because freedom of speech, because the freedom of speech puts rational questions to fanatical belief. And by doing that, it makes fanatical belief peter out and abate and weaken. So these are the kind of two models. It seems like uh, from the viewpoint of the political left, if a person of Christian beliefs uh, makes a statement or refuses to celebrate something, that is regarded by the left as a kind of uh, you know, self-chosen delusion and it should not be a basis for protecting their speech or their actions or their viewpoints. Any criticism of Islam brings an instant storm down from the left on whoever is making that statement. So is the political left's fascination with this uh, elimination of free speech, is, is it, does it have deep roots in a hatred of Christianity? It seems like there's a very selective process here in terms of uh, religion and how the political left is responding to that. <laughs> well, I um, I think that you know, I'm minded to 
think that in terms of free speech, um, certainly in Europe, I wouldn't say that the threats to free speech in Europe and, and around the world are necessarily coming wholly from, from a leftist political position. I think both historically and presently, we see uh, threats from many different parts of the, of the political spectrum. Um, and I think that in terms of the who are the, the victims of these hate speech laws, who I, I, we see this incredible selective enforcement taking place, um, as you identified, and we see this pattern uh, play out uh, repeatedly um, across Europe. And in terms of the, the underlying reasons as they pertain to Christianity, so of course no one's come out and said explicitly that is the case, and I don't think they ever will. But the bias that we see in the enforcement of these laws, in the statements that are uh, um, connected to the sort of cases that come out, there is, in my view, an absolutely undeniable bias against uh, Christianity in the application and the enforcement of these laws in Europe, in many European countries, as they're currently playing out. But I also see in many parts of the world and in, 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 indeed in some parts of Europe, that there is a, a selective enforcement of other forms of speech restrictions against other people as well, uh, both from the left and from other parts of the political spectrum. And therefore, I don't think there's, there's one within the political spectrum, at least in Europe, one free speech position and one anti-free speech, but a, a real mesh. But in, in Western Europe and in leftist, liberal-leaning societies, there is a clear bias in how these laws are being applied. Hi. Um, what work should or could be done at private colleges that purport to have a more traditional, more open style of education like Harvard or most of the Ivy League, um, like schools like that that want to advertise as these free and open colleges where free speech is respected? Like what can and should be done to um, essentially establish that and make sure that comes true? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not so sure that one should uh, so easily believe their claims. Um, they make all sorts of statements uh, about themselves, which are always very beautiful uh, and enchanting. And they kind of believe those statements um, and want you to believe them. That's why they say them. So we can be in a kind of community of belief uh, about something that might not be true. Um, so uh, I, I wouldn't so easily grant that. In terms of what can be done, look, this takes us somewhat uh, off track and into a different direction, but. Uh, a lot can be done, uh, 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 and that kind of playing field is wide open. I know what doesn't work, which is basically what kind of conservatives have been doing for the past 50 years. Um, we've been doing a lot of things like supplementary seminars, like funding tenure lines, like independent centers on campuses. And after about 50 years of that, we're kind of begging on many campuses to just be heard. Uh, so that's not an acceptable situation. And it's not an acceptable situation because, uh, especially because many of these colleges receive federal funding. And so what you end up having is this system where voters, citizens, are paying the bill for these colleges uh, in the form of subsidizing student loans, in the form of giving them uh, federal R&D money. Uh, and in return, what we're getting is some good sciences, without question, and yet uh, population students that are hostile to the nation, to say the least, and often against the freedom of speech. That's what's taking place. It's, it's a form of fraud. And so those two spheres are still very open um, in America. Uh, so I think that, federal, uh, that student loans should be privatized, period. Um, if you do that, uh, then I think basically 80% of America's colleges and universities will shut down. And I think that we're at this stage now that that's not such a bad thing. In fact, it may be a net benefit to the United States. Uh, something like the amount of colleges in the past 50 years has doubled. The dropout rate for four-year degrees is like 60%. I mean, this is, not a, this is not a market demand that has reached this, no, that there should be this number of colleges. 
It's all artificially propped up. So a lot can be done, and if that starts happening, then these universities will not be as brave and courageous as they claim to be today. Um, so that's a real lever. Right in the back. This will be the last question, thanks. First uh, question I have, the panel kind of discussion, whether this one or uh, previous year in a Heritage or any other uh, institution in DC at least, isn't it kind of not freedom of speech, but as an indoctrination, what you say over there, we have to accept it. There is no other chance to, uh, you know, uh, disregard or uh, uh, discuss what you are telling. The other issue is that what would uh, consider that uh, when we go to that uh, uh, internet, I mean, a European human rights decision, uh, if somebody accuses you or your parents that your father married a six years or five years old child, that it's a criminal act, and you have no chance, that person has no chance, or you have no chance to respond. Uh, that uh, uh, Isn't that decision of the court absolutely uh, justified? It's provocative. <laughs> Admit anyone who wants to answer me. <laughs> I don't, I don't have a, uh, I mean, the, the decision of the court, I, I don't know if I fully grasped the question, but the, the decision of the court, in my opinion, is, is absolutely unjustified. And the, the, the lines that they're trying to draw in that decision are completely arbitrary and subjective and are prone to abuse uh, in the future. And I think um, one of the major defenses of why we should um, have freedom of speech and um, counter hate speech laws is because it is freedom of speech that gives us the best chance to speak out against injustice, against many of the, the injustices we see in society around the world. And if we remove that freedom of speech in the guise of hate speech laws, then we are removing a major tool, a major way in which we can counter injustice, in which we can stand up for truth and for freedom. And I think we see how a judgment like this one at the European Court of Human Rights um, so threatens that possibility now and in the future. If, if I can just add one more thing, briefly. Um, your opportunity to be here and to listen to this conversation and to then question what has been said is precisely what is under threat. And if you don't understand that, then the topic continues to elude us. And it's that fundamental. Because hate is ill-defined, it is not static, and it is necessarily expansive. And so, for now, you may be able to avoid its implications. But left unchecked, that is not going to be a sustainable strategy for anyone which is precisely why we have the conversation. And that, I think, is a good, a good note to end things on.